Dear students, or potential students, uh, my name is Bram Paper, I'm a lecturer at uh, Tilburg University, and I'm going to talk today about music as a social problem. You're probably you're well aware of the fact that everybody can have conflicts about or over popular music. That people disagree about the habits or the taste or the values or the behavior. And when you talk about music, it's also usually a, di a discussion between adults versus youth. And when you're young, you used to have another uh, taste about mu of music than when you're older. The main question for uh, this mini lecture is the question, is music a social problem? And how can we understand moral panics around, so around music? Because when you talk about the social problem, you also can talk about the panic which arises in society around a phenomena which people don't like, eh? a social problem. So if we go first a small dive into the theory, you could say, when we talk about moral panics, about different stages in moral panic. First of all, something or someone has to be defined as a threat to values, uh, something we don't like, or interest, also something we don't like, but for another reason. The threat must be depicted in an easily recognizable form by the media. That has to be something which can be easily written or, or uh, um, uh, discussed about in the media. And also there's a rapid buildup of public concern. Something is happening and within a couple of weeks everybody's talking about that issue or that phenomenon that is problematic. Which leads to a situation that also the authorities and opinion makers have to respond on what's happening in society. And the result can be that the panic resides or that the panic uh, starts to shift towards social changes. Well, let's look at a, a couple of different uh, musical problems or problems people have with music. First of all, start with jazz in the roaring 1920s. There was a lot of resistance to, uh, to jazz and there were also certain claims towards jazz. For instance, it leads to sexual excess, which means that music leads to sexual downfall of the youth. And the claims were made by parents, of course, educators, clergymen from the church, from a religious perspective. And also, jazz was something which was aesthetically incompetent. Because jazz was playing a kind of free floating using your instrument, so there were no formal musical rules. And those claims were made by musicians, classically trained musicians, musical critics, and also educators. And the third of all, racial inferiority, which means jazz was mainly performed and enjoyed by black Americans, and increasingly also white Americans. And the middle class white were a little bit afraid about this new form of music. And when you look, for instance, at the, the critics on jazz music in that time, they say, for instance, jazz is at its worst an unforgivable orgy of noise, a riot of discourse, usually perpetrated by players of scant musical training. And jazz is at its worst often associated with foul surroundings, filthy words, and unmentionable dances. Uh, maybe you'll rec 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 recognize some of the critique. Uh, your parents might have on the music you're listening to. If we look at the social context when jazz uh, appeared on the scene in those roaring 1920s in the United States, there was a lot to say about what's happening in society, a lot of transformations. For instance, all kinds of rigid social norms about what to do in public seems to loosen up, more tolerance for drinking, smoking, sensuality, having a good time. Uh, there was the Protestant ethic of thrift, of being very uh, 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 keen on what you would just spend and save, it was replaced by a kind of ethic of consumption and immediate gratification. No saving for, uh, for, for rainy days with direct uh, con consumption and having a good time. Also, most of the time, until the, until the 19th century, 18, 19th, 20th century, a lot of leisure was uh, centered in the home, and now it was replaced slowly by what we nowadays call mass culture. Uh, a lot of uh, people going out, uh, probably what you do also, going out, having a drink in a pub, or going to a club to dance, which was uh, a shift which happened in the uh, 1920s. 
therefore also the small uh, family-centered world uh, where people were very much in, in, in control as, as especially parents were very much in control about who was going where was displaced by a mass public society also kind of uh, loosen uh, a loss of control and you see immediately a reaction by the authorities in 1922 for instance in New York there was a bill which had to regulate jazz music and dancing and within a couple of years these bills were uh, uh, carried out in, in more than 60 communities and cities in the USA when we go 30 years later 30, 40 years later sex drugs and rock and roll in the 1950s uh, for instance Elvis Presley and yeah, well known was one of the uh, famous uh, rock and roll stars and interestingly enough he is seen as one the one who more or less put rock and roll on the map although he was just playing uh, music which was uh, made by a black American artist uh, who were not played on the radio and he was a white artist who was played on the radio interesting if you look at the left picture you only see the upper half of uh, Elvis Presley because uh, at, uh, at uh, an important uh, television uh, uh, show, the Ed Sullivan Show, he was only uh, filmed from, from, from the head to, uh, to, to, around his, to, to his shoulders. Uh, the reason why, because he was dancing very frantically with his legs and his pelvis, that's why he's called Elvis the pelvis, and the mostly female audience liked it very much, but it was seen as a very sexual behavior, so it was not appropriate on national television. And when you look at what happens uh, in rock and roll, you see the same kind of mechanisms happening which we already saw with jazz music. There are all kinds of objections towards rock, rock music from a racial and moral kind of uh, uh, perspective, especially from the radical right wing, the Ku Klux Klan or Christian Crusaders. From politics, uh, we, have to, we talk about the 1950s in the 20th century, the, 20th century, the middle of the 20th century in, in the United States. Rock was also seen as an effort from the Soviet Union, a communist effort to undermine the social and political system of uh, the United States, which is a pretty uh, uh, a grand claim, if I, if, I, if I may say so. But also again, sexuality. The idea was that rock and roll leads to moral corruption of the innocent and vulnerable youth. The, the poor children had to be protected against this a dirty and sexual kind of music. It also was associated already in the 1960s, uh, 1950s, but especially more in the 1960s and 70s with drug uh, use and also drug abuse. Maybe you know the the, sing, uh, the song from uh, the Beatles, the British rock group The Beatles from the 1960s, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And it was actually standing for LSD, which is also right, known as a, a famous drug at that time. Then we enter the 1970s. And in the 1970s, there was a new, uh, for, a new type of music becoming increasingly popular, disco music. And most of you will probably uh, know disco also because in the contemporary dance music, there's a lot of referrals to the old disco music from the 1970s. And the interesting thing about disco music is that actually is a kind of is a music which has as uh, an, an, a side effect an em emancipation of certain groups in society. And in a way, it was realizing the dream of the 1960s, the dream of freedom and of uh, maybe the idea that the hippies had in the 1960s, uh, trying to get rid of the authority of your parents and of the government and then trying to live your life uh, as free as possible. But more important, it was also uh, uh, dancing in, uh, on the disco music was mostly done by homosexuals, Afro-Americans and Hispanics, uh, the uh, minority groups in the United States. And this was a way of emancipating these kind of groups. And it was also a, a total change which was very important in the 1960s. Uh, the 1960s you'll have all those protest songs, uh, rock uh, music, folk music. Uh, people like Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and so on, uh, and it changed. Uh, that those were the, those were politically um, uh, politically uh, uh, loaded uh, uh, songs about, uh, for instance, changing in the in society uh, against the, the war in Vietnam, and disco was about dancing, was about escapism, hedonism, which means 
that the in the important lyrics in those protest songs were actually yeah uh, changed into bodily movements. Uh, disco music is not well known because they have very uh, political or uh, social lyrics. Uh, the, most of the disco music don't have so, not, not much any more lyrics than dance, 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 or I love you, or something like that. So there was a huge change. And interestingly enough, when you talk about emancipation, for instance, dancing with the same sex was forbidden in New York until 1971. And disco is uh, and also a club nowadays, is a place where a lot of people, men dance with men, women dance with women, or they dance together. But that was uh, 50 years ago, that was uh, even forbidden. So in that way, disco was a form of of emancipation and at the same time a lot of people were afraid of disco, especially the older generations. And the, the character of disco was described by Dyer uh, as being erotic, it was directed to, the music was directed to the whole body, the dancing with your whole body. It was about ro uh, romance, it was uh, especially uh, the Philly soul of the 1970s, a lot of violence, it were songs on relationships not on political issues, but on relationships and love. And it was about materialism, consumerism, etc. Uh, think about the luxurious discotheque like Studio 54, or maybe in the, in the, in the early 1980s, uh, when Madonna uh, uh, had her greatest hits with, uh, or her, her uh, huge hits with Material Girl. So the interesting thing about disco is that it, on the one hand, it is a kind of underground sound, uh, which uh, for the specific uh, ethnic minorities, but at the same time, in the in the uh, in the uh, uh, later in the 1970s, it became a mass product. It became mainstream. Uh, disco was music for everybody. It was an enormous growth of the places where you can dance on disco music. Uh, the growth of the, what we now call discotheques or clubs, uh, uh, movies which were uh, uh, promoting the music. For instance, Saturday Night Fever and. As a, as a result, a lot of rock groups started to also change from rock music to a kind of disco-influenced form of rock. Uh, Miss You by the Rolling Stones or I Was Made For Loving You, uh, I Was Made For Loving You by Kiss, that were uh, rock uh, rock groups who who uh, uh, combined their rock music with disco sounds, and also radio stations uh, were switching to the disco format, which means most stations were originally playing uh, adult-oriented rock, uh, uh, rock music, and now they were switching to more and more disco music. So disco also became to be seen as a social problem by a certain part of society. For instance, uh, the most extreme example might be uh, uh, the radio disc jockey Steve Dahl, who organized a disco demolition day at the, in uh, 1979 at, uh, during the, uh, the halftime break of a baseball game, he asked all the people around uh, the Kominsky Park in Chicago to come to the stadium to burn their disco records. And one of the reasons was he was a white uh, uh, male radio disc jockey who used to play all kinds of rock music, but his radio station changed the format to more and more disco and dance oriented songs and he uh, got uh, fired because he was not playing that kind of music. So there was a kind of uh, uh, um, a critique and, and uh, uh, revolt against the, 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 the idea that disco became mainstream. So we now enter the 1980s, again it's a mini lecture so we go rapidly through history. And in the 1980s there was a, a kind of conservative turn in the political climate. Uh, Thatcher in the United Kingdom, Ronald Reagan in the USA. Uh, it was less uh, progressive like the 1960s and 1970s. It became a more conservative climate and there were all kinds of social movements who were concerned with violence against women, anti-drugs, the, 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 the first AIDS uh, outbreak and the panic around AIDS. I mean we, have, we are now panicking about Corona but AIDS is, a, is, a conceivable, is it can also be seen in that kind of light. It was a, a disease nobody understood at that moment. Uh, there were more and more questions there about pornogra more pornography, uh, missing children, child molestation. Uh, the, uh, all kind of social problems, moral pro problems, which were arising and on the political agenda in the 1980s. And interestingly enough, the question is who was getting the blame for these kind of problems? 
Well, music was one of the uh, obvious candidates for taking the blame for all these more uh, social and moral problems in society. Uh, for instance, uh, especially hip hop in the 19 in the in the U United States of America, and there was the the uh, genesis of the Parents Re uh, Music Resource Center, and one of the ladies here is also uh, Tipper Gore, which is the uh, wife of Al Gore, one of those uh, former uh, USA president candidates, and she started a movement against explicit lyrics uh, in music, especially rap and hip-hop music. And probably you're well aware of the sticker Parental Advisory Explicit Lyrics. And they, they try to warn people, especially young people, about all those filthy languages which were used in hip-hop and rap music. So the Parents Music Resource Center was focusing on this, the PM, PMRC was focusing on these kind of uh, problems in, in music. And basically, they had several claims. They said that popular music contributes to a rise in teenage suicide, a rise in teenage pregnancy, and also a rise in drug addiction, especially among youth pe young people. Um, uh, interestingly, in that, uh, in that account, of course, you might know the movie Bowling for Columbine by Michael Moore, who was trying to find out how it was possible that two uh, uh, students of a high school in uh, the United States were killing uh, their fellow high school uh, uh, friends and one of the explanations was that uh, those guys who were killing uh, the, their, their friends and their other, uh, uh, stu the other students were listening to the music of Marilyn Manson and that was one of those yeah, obvious more conservative explanations of a social problem that social problem was caused by listening to the wrong music and at the end of the 1980s, early 1990s, you see the same kind of uh, mechanisms arrive when house music started to uh, enter the scene and also uh, rave, uh, rave music in the UK. And, but mostly the panic around house music in the 1980s, uh, early 1990s, was about the, uh, the use of ecstasy or E. And especially when the first uh, uh, girl, in this case Leah Betts, in 1995, uh, was found dead on a rave party, there was immediately an enormous moral panic about the use of ecstasy pills by young people. Uh, maybe nowadays you're accustomed to go to a pop concert or a festival and you take some uh, weed or uh, pills, but at that time there was an enormous amount of panic uh, in the Netherlands exactly the same. There was also a drug panic in the Dutch party scene, um, although in the Netherlands there were also a lot of uh, 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 pro professionals who were checking the quality of the drugs, which leads to a little bit different situation about the panic than compared to the United Kingdom. Also very interesting was the reaction of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the government, because one of the problems or the, the, the problems around drugs were connected with listening to house music and going to house music raves, there uh, they enforced the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act, which explicitly stated uh, that you give the authorities the, the right to remove persons attending or preparing for a rave. And the rave is also defined as a gathering on a, on a land in open air of 100 or more persons at which amplified music is played during the nights. Uh, and the in interesting thing is that it's also mentioning in the law that the music is an emission of repetitive beats. If you want to uh, know how in the late 1990s uh, music uh, uh, genres like drum and bass or breakbeat uh, arrived, that was also to do with trying to, do, to be not uh, producing repetitive beats, but slightly not repetitive, so that you could escape this Criminal Justice and Public Order Act. So when you look at house music and culture, you will see that also house music like disco is breaking with the long-standing European musical tradition about so clear song, song structures and meaning, meaningful lyrics. And that was also the difference between the 1960s folk music with political lyrics and social lyrics versus disco. We see the same in house music. The interesting thing is sexuality, like in disco, is not only seen from a male point of view. It's a kind of uh, both sexes. And it has an enormous mass appeal, like 
disco music in the late 1970s. And increasingly amount of people are going to raves and enjoying house music in the 1990s. So it's not only for a small subculture, which makes it even uh, more scary for, gener for the older generations. And the interesting thing about house music, which haven't had ha happened before, was that it also was breaking down the barriers between different lifestyles and different social classes and different musical genres. If you think about terms like world music that only appeared on the scene in the late 1970s but had a breakthrough in the 1980s and 1990s. And also the, the, the difference between generations who do like house music was way smaller than it used to be. Okay, well, I have to conclude because I'm already over the 20 minutes. Uh, so what are my concluding remarks if you look in, uh, at uh, music as a social problem? You could see that it's about that music is something which is uh, attacking the existing order. Dancing and rhythm and, and songs uh, without or no songs, and no, no text or whatever, or missing mere, uh, meaningful lyrics. And the hedonistic idea that pleasure is the highest achievement is scary for uh, uh, the the, uh, the powers uh, uh, the powers that be, and especially when you talk about sexuality, there was the fear for bodily movements. Yeah, there's a beautiful uh, quote from a, an author of a religious anti-rock book: uh, "The same coarse bodily movements which led African dancers into a state of frenzy are present in modern dances. It's only logical then that there must be also a correlation in the potentiality of demons gaining possessive control." of a person through the medium of the beat. And there's a kind of racist remarks against African dancers and also a religious connotation by pointing to the devil as, under, as, as kind of the cause for this kind of uh, effect of music. And the interesting thing also from a sociological point of view is that music uh, has to do with youth as an ambiguous category. On the one hand, those usually older generations or People in government try to protect the innocent youth. Uh, they're afraid of sexuality or bodily movements. And they're also afraid of the fact that young people are easily influenced. Uh, uh, think about the parental uh, advisory stickers. But at the same time, older generations usually are a little bit scared for youth because the youth is carrying new, new musical subcultures. So therefore, youth is a human category of transition, of change. And in a broader perspective, you can say that the periodic appearance of the popular music problem is an attempt to assert moral control over a world thought to be out of control. There are a lot of societal changes which are reflected sometimes in music, but that, that, that people who have had difficulties with these changes usually point the, point the finger to music and say, well, music is the cause of all the trouble and evil in the world. But basically, when you look at all those uh, examples I gave, uh, in the past century, you see that there is something different uh, going on. It's not music per se, it's music is only an expression of change. Well, um, I hope you liked the mini lecture. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and have a pleasant day.